Hi, this is Tom from Sailthalia.com. This video describes the navigational equipment and mostly around the electronics from our boat, Thalia. And um, it describes the major systems that we use on board Thalia and um, some of the uh, features of those products and what we've really become satisfied with for long distance cruising on board Thalia. Um, I will say that uh, our boat is uh, almost 30 years old, so um, the equipment is not all that old, but um, it is an older boat. So if you were to buy a, a new boat, uh, it would be a different set of options that you might have available for electronics. But these electronics that we had on board Thalia were uh, something that we were very happy with. Uh, they served us very well from doing long distance sailing from port to port and uh, gave us a lot of confidence while we're underway. So I thought I'd share some of that. These are some various video segments that I recorded over the summer while we were cruising through the Great Lakes. And I'm gonna start off with the autopilot system. So I hope you enjoy it, and uh, please leave me feedback um, on YouTube or on our blog, www.sailthalia.com. Hope you enjoy it. So I'll talk a little about our autopilot. We're using our autopilot all the time and uh, rarely do we hand steer unless we're in a um, tight area, anchorage, or if there's, um, you know, we did a lot of hand steering in the Erie Canal for obvious reasons. But out here, um, we're using it all the time. It does a lot better job most of the time than we can do by hand steering. And uh, this is, a, we have an older uh, autopilot. It's made by Raytheon at the time, Raytheon, but now it's changed names to Raymarie. So there is a, uh, what they call a control head here, that um, you enter in, you, you can sort of pick your compass course. Right now we're on a compass course of 197. And then I, to start the autopilot, I hit the um, auto button over here, and that holds that compass course. And if I want to turn it off, I can push standby. And then you can make adjustments here, plus or minus one degree in compass heading, or larger changes, plus or minus 10 degrees. And there's some other adjustments on here as well. So I'll step back and you can kind of, you can see that the wheel is doing its thing. Um, it's turning as it needs to to correct for that, to hold that compass course. Um, like I said, it does a really good job. There's a couple different settings for uh, its response rate and so we played around that a little bit either it can respond quicker to the changes in compass uh, heading or slower the advantage of slower is that it takes less battery usage so autopilots in general use a lot of electricity as you can see it's moving in these kind of conditions it's moving all the time and uh, you can sort of eyeball our, our heading on the boat here, you can see that even if, though it's steering to a compass course, the boat's going to still drift from side to side a bit, uh, especially as we're hit by these waves. You can see it, it's going to swing over to one side over here and then back over the other, uh, which would happen normally if you're hand steering. Um, and, you know, it's trying to get your average course to be what is on that magnetic reading. So that's the autopilot. Helps us a lot, especially in conditions where you don't have a very good um, target to aim for, like on the shore or whatever. If it's hard to see something to aim for, it's really hard to hand steer in those conditions, or at night, obviously. But um, even in these conditions where the shore is pretty far away and it's pretty flat, not discreet, not a lot to really pick out as far as mountains or what have you. Uh, today you can steer a little bit by the clouds. They would help to get you know, a general idea of your, your heading, then you could look down at the compass every once in a while. Um, but most times it's pretty hard to hold a, a good compass heading. The only time that the hand steering would really help is um, when you're standing here, you can anticipate the waves coming and how they're gonna push the boat off course. And you can see them coming towards you on the stern and you can correct the rudder in anticipation of that, the way the boat's gonna respond. The autopilot tries to do that. It has a, kind of a, a learning mechanism where it tries to pick up on the 
period of the waves, how many seconds apart each wave is, and so it tries to anticipate that. It'll get better and better after a couple minutes of starting it, um, but still it's not quite as good that way as a human is. So the main part of the autopilot mechanism, oh boy, I'm not gonna be able to see it, but down inside here is a, um, a black, arm. I'll try to get a better picture of this, but that's pushing against the what's called the rudder quadrant and turning the rudder. So that's where all the mechanical parts are going on down there. And then down below in the boat, in one of the aft berths, is the actual compass. It's got its own compass and what's called a course computer, which is all the brains for how it works. So this is the um, Raymarine uh, pilot mechanism I was talking about earlier. You can kind of see it here. It's this black, uh, they call it a linear drive. Um, it's a motor unit here and it's pushing a rod that goes in down in here to where the rudder quadrant is and actually turns the rudder directly. Um, although you see the wheel moving back and forth up, up above, this is actually driving the rudder directly and the wheel is responding to that. So it's kind of cluttered down here. Um, we don't worry about too much stuff around this because this thing doesn't move much. It's going, it's going in and out this way mostly to rotate slightly. But this is where all the energy is going to. We've got some wires coming in here that control the motor. Um, and you can kind of hear it. Yeah, you know, it's const pretty much constantly moving in these kind of conditions. And it's sort of warm, but not too warm. But this is this is the heavy lifting going on right there. So that's a little bit about how our autopilot works. Um, again, our autopilot's made by uh, Raytheon, or now Raymarine, and it's a linear, um, how do they call it? Yeah, linear drive autopilot. It's got that kind of ram or piston that's pushing it out of that black box I just showed you earlier. It's got a motor in it that's turning and pushing it in and out. And um, there are other styles of autopilots. Um, there's ones that have a, a wheel around the tiller, I'm sorry, around, around the helm, around the actual wheel. It's got a smaller wheel around that and a belt, and there's a little motor that turns that belt. So it's actually directly rotating the, um, the wheel that you steer with. And that's one approach. Um, for bigger boats, they use a hydraulic uh, autopilot in some cases. So it's a hydraulic pump, and then that hydraulic fluid then is pushing against the rudder to turn it. Um, some pros and cons about that. H hydraulic ones are a lot stronger, but they're prone to leaks. If you have a leak, and you got hydraulic fluid going everywhere in your boat, and uh, hard to trace where the leak is. So we're really happy with this autopilot. It is an older one. Um, but they do sell them still. I can get a replacement uh, in your drive, which is probably the part that would wear out the first. But we've been happy with it. We use it a lot, and it saves us a lot of time and, and makes it a lot more convenient for them. So as I mentioned on the autopilot, it's got uh, some components that are down inside the boat. So I'm in the um, starboard quarter berth. Uh, Maybe a little bit dark for you to see this, but. Um, I wanted to show you, this is a previous owner had mounted all this stuff, but this is the gear. So, um, right here uh, where the light is shining, that is the course computer. It's where all the brains are for the autopilot, and you can see a lot of wires coming in there. That's where it controls the, um, the power coming in, the power going out to the motor, um, some of the navigation data coming in to the course computer. And then down below here, is that little round device is the um, flux gate compass. So that's got a magnetic compass inside there and any little slight change to the course heading of the boat is picked up by the compass and sent to the course computer for it to correct the um, angle of the rudder. So that's the kind of brains behind the autopilot.
the helm on this, um, this is called a nav pod pedestal mount, and I've squeezed in three instruments. Um, the autopilot down here, the control head for that. Uh, this is the new Garmin Sharp Plotter. It's a GPS map 547XS. Um, it's got a relatively small screen compared to a lot of the ones that are sold now, but um, it's the size fit just right. And our older one was the exact same size of this, but it didn't have a lot of the new features that are out there right now. So this one we just bought over the last winter and put in now. So um, right now it's showing, you'll probably see some flutter on the video, but it's showing uh, the screen that shows our wind information, apparent uh, wind speed, true wind speed, 13 knots there, true wind angle, apparent wind angle, our GPS speed over the ground, and our GPS heading. But you've got a whole bunch of other options and screens, and it can be just a normal uh, chart plotter as well, showing you uh, the chart and where you are. But we use it a lot these days to just show the wind information. Um, it's a convenient place to look and find it. Over on the left side here, we have an iPad uh, that's running iNavix, and it's got charts. Um, these are having to be charts from Navionics for the Great Lakes. You'll see things that are upside down because I have it um, oriented in our in our course up position instead of north up. I could also flip the chart around here, and now we've got a north up orientation. All the numbers and everything line up. And you can see a little symbol here, which is our boat. Uh, the blue is uh, our, dis our heading to the waypoint off the land over here on Thunder Bay Island. And the yellow is our current heading. So we're, we're jiving downwind here. Um, and so we're gonna jive back over and eventually meet up with that waypoint. But we've been really happy with iNavix. Um, this is the first time we've used it on the boat. I had to kind of, like I mentioned, squeeze in enough room on the nav pod here to make room for it. But it's great. Your finger gestures and all that are there. Um, a lot of information across the top in terms of distance to the waypoint, time to waypoint, ETA, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm definitely using up all the space here for that, and we're really happy with this. Um, I guess the one drawback of a, an iPad is that you got to have it plugged in outside. So I've got to separately, as opposed to wiring it directly into the unit. So I've got a short little USB cable here that's charging from a USB port down here. So that's a little bit exposed to the elements and the water and all that. Um, the case itself is a waterproof case, so no problem there. Um, they can get wet. But this part, this port opened up down here, makes it a little susceptible to water. <coughs> the advantage, one of the big advantages though of an iPad is that we can take it off of here and I can take it down below or we can take it anywhere else in the boat and it's working through wireless and tells us all the information we need. Um, so it's super helpful that way. Obviously these things are permanently mounted and uh, they're wired in with all the power so there's no issue with water intrusion, but you can't take it with you. So at night when we arrive at a port, we usually take this off and take it down below for uh, so nobody is tempted to get on the boat and take it. But uh, it's very helpful for its portability. And obviously it's got a huge screen compared to this one. So that's the electronics here. And over on the side, we've got a uh, handheld for the VHF. So this has all the controls for the VHF. Right now we're scanning channel 13 and 16. Um, but it's got all the volume and squelch and all that controlling a VHF that's down below in at the nav station. So we use this almost all the time for reaching people and communicating. And then we got the typical uh, binnacle compass there. So those are our electronics at the helm. And I'll just show you over here what we got <coughs> at the companionway. Um, these are a couple older model sailing instruments, originally made by Navman, and then more recently made by Northstar. Uh, I think out of uh, New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken. So in the middle there, this is a wind instrument showing the wind angle, apparent wind angle to the boat. So um, the wind is coming from behind us on the starboard side, 122 degrees apparent wind, and this is the wind speed, apparent wind speed, so nine knots. 10 knots. True wind speed right now for us is closer to 15. 
Uh, on the right hand side we've got a speed, uh, sorry, uh, depth and speed, uh, multi instrument here, and then over here we've got a repeater. Uh, it shows the same information. The reason this repeater is here is we've had problems with the screen on this. You can see this actually is supposed to read 79 at the top, so we've got a few missing segments there. It's supposed to be 80 feet. Um, the top part is a little messed up, the lower part's fine. So um, sometimes it comes back and re reads the numbers okay, but just to make sure and also to have two places to look at, um, to reassure the numbers that you're seeing, you can look at either one and do that. So down below we also have another repeater, which I'll show you in a minute, um, that shows various information like speed and depth, but you know, speed, depth, and wind are the critical things when you're sailing. So those are our instruments. Um, we like the location of where they are because anybody in the cockpit, including the person steering, but anybody sitting in the cockpit can see the instruments. I'm not a big fan of having all the instruments at the helm um, because up here at the helm, great, they're visible to just the person steering, but nobody else can really participate and uh, understand what's going on, adjust the sails for the wind angle, be looking, watching for depth while the helmsman is, uh, helmsman, helmswoman is steering. So it's nice to have instruments that are visible to whoever's in the cockpit. Other times you might see them up above the companionway or in race boats, they are often mounted right on the bottom part of the mast with big, big displays there. So those are our instruments. The only other thing I'll show you is our radar, which is over here, just to the right of the steering the helm station. It's an old unit, older unit from Furuno, um, and old, but it works well. We don't use it that often. Like most people you talk to that have radar, they don't use it too often, but when they do use it, it comes in handy. Um, it's, uh, you know, if you sail in areas like we do up in uh, coast of Maine with a lot of fog, then you definitely need radar. Uh, and even we used it yesterday, the other thing you can use it for in addition to fog is to sort of identify where there are pockets of rain. You see heavy clouds coming around, like they're rainy. You can pick up that rain on the radar and then you can follow it and see, okay, are we getting ahead of it? Or is it coming towards us? Is it going away? So that's helpful um, to have that. And uh, so that's the, that's the control head for the radar um, and the actual ray dome, which is the antenna, is up in the unit up here on a gimbaled unit hanging off the backstay there and I've mounted a foghorn below it. But you can see this unit here. Um, you'll see quite a few of these even though they're older units, they're on a lot of boats. And uh, so it's got a swinging uh, array inside that enclosure. Okay, I'll talk next about AIS, which is a special piece of electronics that's uh, very, very helpful. One of the most valuable things we have on board as far as navigation electronics. So AIS stands for Automatic Identification System, and it's a means for um, a boat to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a system where a, a boat, ha the data that the boat uses around navigation, so its speed, its direction, the size of the boat, um, in some cases the destination of the boat, what kind of boat it is, sailboat, powerboat, tugboat, whatever, all this information is broadcast on a reserved designated VHF channel. And then other boats then can receive this data and um, know, you know who's who and who's where. So there's, um, in our case, we have a black, what's called a black box AIS, so it's all the intelligence of sending out that data and receiving it. You can get a, a receiver only AIS, but most times today, the transmitter and receiver isn't that much more money than just the receiver unit. It used to be more expensive. So a black box unit, and then that's, that sends data to a sharp plotter. So, uh, just to give you an example of what it looks like, on our iNavX screen on the iPad, again, this is our location right here, and I can zoom out a little bit, and I see another boat here with its heading um, and a little symbol next to it that has its name. So again, sorry, this is upside down, but it says, let's see if I can rotate around here. There we go. Um, 
So that boat name is H. Lee White. And if I tap on the symbol, it'll tell me all much information about it. It was last updated at 1251, which is just now. Um, it's MMSI number, that's a unique identifier for the boat. It's call, radio call sign, it's course over ground, so 350 degrees magnetic. It's heading, um, it's pointed almost in the same direction. It's speed over ground of 11.8 knots. It's bearing, uh, it's, it's bearing to me, so 113 degrees um, compass heading from me is where the ship is. Its range is 6.3 nautical miles away. Um, CPA stands for closest point of approach. So based on our two headings, the closest we would come across on our course would be 5.9 nautical miles. That's really important information. So you can set this to warn you uh, of a certain CPA range. In other words, if you want it to know, you want it to alarm you when you have a boat that's within one mile CPA of you, you can set that up. Um, not sure what TCPA, oh time, probably time to uh, closest point of approach is six minutes. Um, bearing to closest point of approach is 90 degrees, so uh, if we headed towards, we took a bearing of 90 degrees, I believe that would mean that that would give us the closest point of approach, meaning collision. <laughs> their latitude and longitude, their type is a cargo ship, um, and the length is 702 feet, and beam and depth. So, may not be able to see it too well, but right on the horizon over there is H. Lee White. That's the ship there. Um, so, very helpful information, and we use this all the time. Uh, one of the most immediate helpful things is if you're trying to reach a ship, uh, you can know the name right here and you can call them on the radio and ask them what their intentions are, what direction, you know, if, they're, if you're in a narrow channel, you can ask them if they're going to want to go in front of you or behind you or what's convenient for them and all that information. I'm just trying to find our way back. Here we are, to where we are. Um, so that's helpful. So, some of the components of AIS, there's two antennas that are used in AIS. Um, one is a GPS antenna, which is, so we have a AIS uh, product from Vesper Marine. So this is the GPS antenna, it's receiving uh, information on all that, the speed over ground, the course, uh, heading, and all that information, all is calculated here. This is our existing uh, GPS antenna for the Garmin chart plotter. So AIS requires a separate uh, GPS feed, and um, that's helpful because it can be a backup in case there's an issue with our Garmin uh, chart plotter GPS positioning. This can we can get this over Wi-Fi. So that's one of the antennas. The other antenna is up here, mounted on our our, our arch. That one on the left there. It looks very much like a VHF antenna, and it's very similar to that. It's a transmits on one of the VHF channels, but they do make a dedicated AIS antenna that's tuned precisely for the VHF channel that's used. Uh, it's a slightly different length. You can use a VHF, uh, VHF antenna and use a, like a, it's like a splitter that splits the um, use of it between your VHF radio and the AIS device. Uh, I chose to have a separate dedicated AIS antenna that was tuned precisely for AIS transmission and in case there's ever an issue with the VHF antenna on the mast head, uh, we can still use this for transmitting AIS information. So those are the two antennas that are involved. Okay, another uh, kind of a piece of electronics, not really navigation electronics, but still a piece of elect electrical gear we have on the boat, is a device called the Wiry. Um, and it is our kind of link to the outside world. What it does is it does two things. It either picks up a cellular uh, data connection, like through AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and then rebroadcast that signal as a Wi-Fi signal on the boat, or it picks up uh, a Wi-Fi signal on shore somewhere from a marina, a restaurant, what have you, um, and broadcast that locally on the boat. So I'll show you what that that looks like. It's basically an antenna with uh, some stuff inside a box there. So it's mounted on the side of our arch. The uh, the antenna there is the one that picks up Wi-Fi, and then it's got basically a little router 
inside there in that white box. And the idea here is that it picks up weaker Wi-Fi signals and um, it has a more um, better ability to pick up weak signals and broadcast back your data back to the Wi-Fi point on shore. So that's the white antenna and then the white box is all the brains behind it. All that device needs is a, uh, a power supply. So all the mechanism is here. Other devices that I looked at had an antenna up here that you'd mount up high and then the, all the brains of it all down below inside the, the boat. But this is all packaged together. Um, on the far side there, you can see a thicker kind of antenna thing underneath the solar panel. That's an, a special cellular antenna, long range cellular antenna. Um, I'll get a better angle of it over here. You can kind of see it right up there. So that one right there in the middle is their special uh, optional long range cellular antenna. And that picks up signals uh, up to 10 or 20 miles offshore. And again, it's cellular signal, so we use at and a little SIM card from at and And that picks up uh, signals from offshore and then broadcasts it with the wiry Wi-Fi antenna there through a local area to our boat so we can get data, email, uh, web browsing, that kind of thing. Any kind of data usage you would use, normally use for a phone or a tablet. Our own Wi Fi network on the boat. So, one of the handy things about it is that both use Wi Fi and cellular, kind of which one is best for your situation. Um, some other devices only do Wi Fi, kind of Wi Fi amplifying is what it's called. Um, this does both, so you can switch back and forth. You've got a good Wi Fi signal from shore, um, you can use that, and when that peters out or you take off from the anchorage, then you can turn it over to cellular and you can use cellular connection. And then it's still the same Wi-Fi network on the boat. Uh, on our boat it's called Thalia W. So we have devices connected to that and they, they use whatever the wire is set up with. It. So um, it was a little tricky to set up. Uh, there was a guy named Mark from Island Consulting who is the, the um, company behind the product. And we had a back and forth kind of frustrating few several weeks really more like a month initially when we first used it. Um, but Mark, I'm, I'm back on board now and I think it's a good product. Uh, we have to reboot it every couple times, every other day or so um, as we move around. But um, generally it works pretty well and, and I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, there's no other product like it on the market and it's been, been helpful for us for all the data usage. So we use it for a variety of reasons, obviously just for email and all that, but for getting weather, it's great for um, pulling up weather on a web browser while we're far offshore. So it's a good product for that reason, if nothing else. Okay, so this is the nav station, navigation station on Thalia. Um, you know, when we used to navigate through mostly through paper charts. This would be the place you lay out your big paper chart and get your parallel rulers and compass and you know plot your course and bearings and all that. Um, so we use it uh, well first of all it's a couple places to sit. I'm facing forward on the boat. Um, can't really see it quite too well but it's not got a curved seat here so you kind of saddle right in. And uh, Again, you're facing forward, so the up and down pitch of the boat doesn't feel quite as bad. And if you're heeled over, you can slide over to the part that's curved and see if it's comfortable. So it's a good spot. I, I work here on my computer quite a bit. We've got places to hook in to for power and all that. So this is the nav station. Okay, so I'll show you some electronics that are available down here at the nav station. Um, first one is this VHF uh, radio that's mounted up here. This is an ICOM. VHF, it's uh, M422, it's a model number. Um, so it's, as I mentioned before, we've got the remote handheld mic up in the cockpit and it's all connected to the same radio. So it, this is 
scanning 1316 and if you change the channels up there it'll show that channel up here as well and then you've got your own microphone here um, so it's pretty much got all the same controls um, up there as it is, does down here and this is a D DSC uh, enabled VHF so it gets the GPS position from one of the two GPS devices on the boat. Um, if we have to have an extended VHF conversation, it's, I, I usually find it easier to come down here. First off, it's less windy, so you can be heard better. Uh, in, in parallel, you can hear them better because it's a little bit better speaker and it's a little quieter here. And again, if you have an extended conversation or if you're on kind of cruisers and that, where you're checking in and you're waiting for people to go through and it's a, you know, minutes or an hour long, it's a lot more comfortable to sit down here and do that. So that's the VHF radio. Um, next to it is our single sideband. So this is also an ICOM unit, uh, M802, very, very common single sideband radio. So that's this whole head unit here with a microphone. Uh, this is the speaker for it. Um, I don't have it on right now. We don't actually have it fully hooked up. Um, I disconnected the antenna the last time we took the mast down and I haven't connected the antenna back up. But it's a complicated thing. It involves a lot of money and a lot of setup and a lot of tuning and grounding of a single sideband. Yeah, it was a real pain. Uh, but when it works, it's basically like a uh, ham radio. So you can communicate with people, in theory, all around the world if the, if the uh, uh, atmospheric conditions are correct. So that's a single sideband radio. Um, the other thing is that we've got here in the nav station, this is the repeater that I talked about earlier. So this is repeating data that's up on those instruments up above. Right now it's showing the wind strength, uh, seven knots, eight knots. I can um, show other NMEA data, or I can show um, the depth and speed that we're going. This is usually what we leave it on here. So that's kind of nice when we're down below. Say we're anchored and um, we're getting some high winds. We want to see exactly how strong the wind is. It's nice to be able to sit here and, and, and get that. Um, this is a battery monitor from, um, it's called a Link 20. Very, had been a very popular monitor. I don't think they make it anymore, but it monitors two banks. So I've got the house bank here and the engine bank. And I can see right now, for instance, on the house bank, we're putting 4.9 amps back into the battery bank, that's from our solar panel array, and I can see that um, we're charging back up to full charge, we're 24.8 amp hours in deficit, so it's been charging um, throughout today to get up to that point, um, and also shows your voltage, so right now we're at 14.1 voltage, and like I said, I can go to the equivalent numbers on the engine side, so the engine's getting a little bit of a trickle charge of 0.3, uh, 0.4 amps going into the engine battery. So that's the Link 20. Uh, last thing I'll just show you over here is the refrigeration. This is the temperature control for the refrigeration. Right now the refrigeration is at 38.5. Um, this kicks on at 39.5. It sends a, um, a signal to the compressor to turn on and then it shuts off at 37.5 so it's a two degree range so this is handy to have the temperature visible from anywhere in the cabin so you can make sure that things are going okay with the refrigeration uh, it's keeping the temperature correct and that it's running and all that so that's uh, that's why it's prominently displayed there okay i talked earlier about the uh, black box ais and that's the brains that processes all the AIS data coming from other boats and the data from our boat that's being sent out. So that's located um, behind our panel here um, where all our circuit breakers are. It doesn't have a screen at all, so it doesn't need to be anywhere special. And so it's down in the bowels here of all of our electronics up here in the top spot there where the light is shining. So that's made by Vesper Marine, and it's got uh, cables coming into it for the two antennas. It's got a data cable and a uh, power cable and that kind of stuff. So that's where all the AIS stuff goes on. Um, down below is a Wi-Fi module. This is made by Shipmodal, uh, Miniplex 3WI. So that takes in um, a lot of data from the different instruments and then retransmits it out over a Wi-Fi signal and also 
through just a regular wired uh, connection for other devices to process. So you need something like this if you're going to use iNavX on an iPad. iPad only can get, can only get its data through Wi-Fi. Uh, so you need something like this. There's different products. Um, uh, this one seemed to get pretty good reviews. It was pretty easy to set up. Um, it also works with Raymarine and their SeaTalk uh, network. So that was nice. And uh, so it's a critical component. It'll take you a while to set something up like this. Um, there are, you know, like in our case, we have all these different um, instruments from different manufacturers, and you want to integrate them together. You need to have them all wired into that uh, product, that multiplexer, and then that sends out the data, like I said, over Wi Fi. Uh, so it'll take you time. I mapped it all out in a big piece of butcher paper, all of the instruments and what kind of data they can send out and what kind of data they can receive in. And it's a big kind of spaghetti chart of lines going everywhere. Um, if you, I guess, are fortunate enough to get a boat at some point, new boat or used boat, and you put all new electronics in at one time and you choose one manufacturer, and you choose something like uh, the Namiya 2000 network protocol, uh, something like that, where it's just one backbone of cabling that takes all the data on that one backbone. That would be a pretty sweet way to go. Um, older boats like ours, you inherit some older equipment, and you can't be in the position to buy all new equipment at one time. So the kind of multiplexer I just showed you is a way to get around that and to be able to have all the instruments talk to each other and share data across the way. And like I said, a live use an iPad, which is a really cool way to go. Um, even if you already have a chart plotter, even if you have a nice chart plotter, I would recommend getting an iPad and using navigation on that uh, for the advantages of simply as a backup, but also the fact that you can carry it around anywhere in the boat. I can sit up on the bow and read and be navigating and look at the chart, looking at other boats on AIS. So it's very, very helpful. But beware, it takes a long time to set up. Uh, you might want to consider getting some brain electronics person to help you if necessary. One more piece of kind of electronics that we use is this little puppy here. This is a um, portable depth sounder. Um, it's made by, I don't know, like Hawkeye. Uh, it's just a digital sonar. You can get these different models of these. Um, different companies make these. It's waterproof. Um, you put it, that little lanyard around your wrist and you push this button to light up the display. Right now it says zero feet. You dip it down in the water and it'll tell you the depth of the water. So we use this on occasion when uh, uh, going out in the dinghy and to measure the depth either ahead of the boat where we're going or if we're in an anchorage and we're not quite sure uh, how deep it is for the boat to swing around on its anchor. We'll go out with this little guy and buzz around uh, the circumference of the anchor and uh, test the depth of the water just to be sure. Uh, like we use this up in the North Channel when we were anchored in um, Mary Marianne Cove, I think it was, to see, to feel comfortable that even though we were really close to the rocks and the edge of the cove, that it still was deep enough, and it indeed was. So it's very handy. Um, I don't think they float, so you want to make sure you hold on to it closely. Uh, but we use it, it's just a good security measure. We used it a lot in the intercoastal waterway. Um, when we were either getting into too shallow water or in some cases we were, we were soft to ground. We knew we'd go out in the dinghy and the person in the dinghy would guide the person in the boat in terms of where the deep water was so that, yeah, they could head that way. So a nice little piece of extra technology. Okay, I'm in the port quarter berth now and I'm going to show you some of the uh, pieces of equipment for the solar system that we have on board Thalion. Um, up above in the cockpit on the uh, radar or stern arch is the actual solar array, uh, but down here is the kind of brains behind it. So in, I know this will be a little bit dark, but inside here is the charge controller. So um, this is made by Xantrax, um, and you 
you maybe see there on the display what it's reading. Um, it's 11.5 amps, 11 amps now, 161 watts. So that's how much it's charging uh, coming off of the solar array and into the battery bank system. Um, it can put out more than that. It's a 500 watt array, two 250 watt panels. Um, but that's apparently all it's required. We've got the battery bank mostly charged up. Um, it's feeding some of that off to go to the autopilot refrigeration. But um, that's a, this is a critical part. Um, any kind of uh, solar system needs a, a pretty strongly built, uh, well-designed charge controller. It takes the voltage from the solar panels, which is not uh, in 12 volt or, or, or 13 or 14 volt, but I think in ours it's like 32 or 36 volts, and it steps it down to the correct voltage um, without losing any inefficiency. So, and then it obviously controls how much needs to go in the battery bank based on the current charge. Uh, it does things like um, controls the charge amount if the batteries are getting too hot, it'll uh, turn down the amperage a bit, and uh, it'll do other things like that. So, charge control is really important. The other thing is um, to have a um, kind of complete on-off switch system. So I have this that I've set up with its breaker, um, and it completely shuts off the system. So if I flip this switch down, it'll disconnect the array from the charge controller and turn off the power to the charge controller as well. So that's there and protected. So that wraps up uh, the video on the navigation equipment and electronics on board Thalia. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of different things that are involved in setting up a cruising boat for long distance sailing. When I was young and I started sailing, I just used a compass and hand, hand bearing compass and uh, paper charts and dividers and parallel rulers, and it was no electronics involved at all. So uh, things have come a long ways. I mean, you can certainly still navigate with paper charts and you should have copies of paper charts on board. Um, but the things that I just showed you on what we've set up Thalia with um, really help us to make cruising more comfortable, safer, um, uh, give us confidence that we know where we're going, um, help us look out for other dangers out there, other boats, shallow water, uh, storm conditions and all that. Um, I, if you're looking at setting up your cruising boat for long distance cruising or um, want to make some modifications, hopefully some of the ideas I've shared with you are helpful. And as always, I look forward to your feedback and comments. Thank you very much.